the first couple of slides talked about the environment and animals, our interaction with animals is changing. Um, we are intruding into animals' natural habitat. That's brought uh, wild animals close to humans in dangerous way. We no longer see bats on trees. We see them oftentimes in cooking pots. People eat bats, people handle bats. We no longer see monkeys on the trees, but they are on the streets. It's a common uh, scenario. And elephants are in our backyard. So we do share not only the environment, but also the diseases. That's an important point I'm going to make. More than 70% of human infections are in fact transmitted by animals. Ebola, who, how can we forget, in Britain, you know, so many hundreds and thousands of people died in West Africa. Avian flu is still fresh in our memory, was transmitted from hen, I mean from flies, I mean uh, uh, birds. Swine flu, and then there are these other diseases which I study, toxoplasmosis transmitted by pet cats. Others which are transmitted by animals such as horses, and these are dangerous. And can you believe that pigeon droppings can actually transmit cryptococcus neoformans, which can give you meningitis? These are all facts. Ear of a normal animal looks nice and healthy, but oftentimes the cattle that we see around us carry ticks. These are the ticks that transmit the diseases that I showed you. These are the ones that are actually the transmitting vectors. That's why what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes that we must keep our animals healthy to remain healthy. And we are reaching out to the community. As a scientist, I decided to extend my work out of the lab into the community. We go to the field, we go to the villages, my scientist colleagues and me, we look at sick animals, all kinds of sick animals, including those in the zoo. We partner with Cuba. They rescue animals and we treat them. The pro procedure is actually we collect blood samples and this is where the science comes in. It's not just animal love, but a little bit of technique, technology. We do microscopic examination, and here you can see, you can actually see the parasite in a red cell. Oftentimes we do DNA extraction. If we can't see the parasite with naked eye, we do DNA extraction, and this uh, polymerase chain reaction is done to get signals corresponding to a specific parasite. We strive for early detection in order to keep the animal healthy and do the right treatment. Healthy cow and wealthy farmer. Sounds like Modi's dump cart. Our goal is one world, one health. That's what I'm going to tell you guys this evening, that we have to be careful about the environment that we live in. Maybe, may I have the first slide? We do work with colorful things. Colorful things that look beautiful under the microscope. They have beautiful shapes. As you can see, heart-shaped Giardia, Lamblia, Amoeba. You know, Entamoeba histolytica. But can you believe that these beautiful looking creatures actually cause fatal diseases? Both of these guys cause diarrhea. Most of us have had that when we consume street food. I'm going to tell you today not about all of these beautiful but nasty creatures that we study in the lab, but focus on two of them. Malarial parasite, which is technically called Plasmodium falciparum. It was in newspapers today. I'm not going to tell you why, but it's in Times of India science page. And then trypanosoma is another parasite, again, intriguing the shape and the beauty with which it moves, as you'll see later, but causing really horrendous disease and killing people. Next one, please, if, or maybe I should do that. Press it too hard. Well, in some ways, parasites that I'm going to talk about really work like the curses that we often read in Harry Potter books, the ones that w Lord Voldemort used in the book, in the Harry Potter books. Imperius Cruciatus Abada Kedavra, for those of you who missed it. Imperius meaning the parasite takes over the host. It takes control of the host system. That's what is depicted here and that's what I do in my study in my research. Cruciatus meaning that the parasite causes cruciating pain in the host. That's what it does when it establishes Avada Kedavra, ultimately killing the host. Really, these are the three curses that nicely explain what the parasite does, and the rest of it is just technical details of how it does this. And this is what I study, my friends. Next slide, and again, I think I'll do that. So there is, this is the workflow of what scientists try to do in their laboratory, and in mine, this is what I do. We do 
little, some research in the laboratories through multidisciplinary approaches, you know, it's, and, and, and arrive at certain conclusions. This is the lab research. But over the years, I have tried to reach out to the clinical com problems in the world, as I showed you, that to the community, to the sick animals, even sick humans. We are trying to develop new technologies. This happens to genome sequencing and some other, other sciences that I don't want to get into detail today. Finally, over the long, over the years, we hope that some of our research will actually lead to better medicine, better medicine to treat diseases. We do need better medicines. As I said, please go back and read what's happening to malaria drugs today. Most of the malaria drugs available today, malarial parasite does not respond to. It's become resistant. So we continually need to research for new drugs. This is what I do. And I'm going to summarize this story in two subcategories to tell you what we do. In the first part, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the technical aspects of my work. How do parasites acclimatize in their host? Every scientist has a hypothesis, and so do I. What I'm going to try and tell you is how do we pursue a scientific question? Many years back, it's really a saga. About 20 years back, when I returned from Yale University, I came to India to set up my research program, and I thought that, hey, what am I going to do if I, I, I follow what I have learned elsewhere at Yale, there was cutting edge research happening, I don't need to tell you that, or I do something that's relevant to what I, what's happening around me. And that's what I decided to do. I went by my hunch. I see, I see a lot of infections around me, and I decided I will apply my knowledge to address what are these organisms, what are these diseases, and can we find better ways to treat them, and how. It's a little story. How do parasites acclimatize in their hosts? Very quickly, I'm going to take you through the life cycle of a typical parasite, malarial parasite, which all of us are familiar with. Many of us remember that it's transmitted from mosquito vector into the human body through an insect bite through the, during the blood meal by the mosquito. The parasite is in the salivary gland, and then it may, finds its way into the bloodstream of the human. Simple question, like a school kid, I still th think like a school kid, and that's a good way to do it, because you'll never go wrong if you think with your heart. I asked the question that, look, when the parasite is, the is in the mosquito, it would experience temperature like on a day like this, 25 degrees Celsius. But when it jumps into the human, tell me what temperature will it experience? Anybody? Anybody in the audience? 37. I see a brave boy there in the back. 37 degrees. So 37 minus 25 is how much? 12 degrees. Imagine a primitive parasite experiencing a 10 degree jump in temperature. How does it cope with it? That's the question I asked. You know, for in, in order for it to be successful, it must have mechanism to cope with it. And furthermore, in malaria, the patient temperature goes as high as 41, 42, 43 degrees Celsius. So there's yet another, what you might call heat shock that the parasite has to cope with. It does so because malaria is a reality. It does happen. So there must be a way by which the parasite copes. This is what I thought about many years ago. Well, I decided to spend a few years, about 20 years, to address this question. I still address that. What happens to us when we get into a, you know, let's say, oven which has higher temperature, let's say 20 degrees, or we go to, let's say, Rajasthan in the middle of summer and, you know, drink lassi on the streets? This is what happens to us. Many of us really have a heat stroke. And then we have to have a fan, we have to have fluids, we have to have mechanisms to keep us comfortable. How, does, how do cells do that? What keeps cells comfortable when they suffer from heat shock? This is what happens. What happens inside of cells is that proteins undergo damage when they are subjected to heat shock, like the one that I showed you in the parasite. They get unfolded and they don't function anymore. If they are bad enough, if they're damaged beyond control, they can be di disposed. So there's a mechanism in the cell to dispose damaged things. But also there's a mechanism like the ambulances and the nurses and the doctors. There's a mechanism that will try to repair the dam damaged proteins. And that's what we study. How do cells repair damaged proteins? And these guys which do this job are called molecular chaperones. Some of you may recall the name term chaperones. I think go back and look in the dictionary. It's a beautiful, I think, um, uh, history as to what, how this term came about. But chaperones are the ones which control protein damage and help go to the emergency room, work on the proteins, get them reactivated. And that's how cells survive. So in malaria, what's it, what is it that's doing its job? That's the question I ask, and if, if that's the one that's going to keep malarial parasite alive, if we somehow get rid of these chaperones or kill them, then the malarial parasite shouldn't grow. That's as simple as that. 
And that's exactly what we did. For the last 20 years, we are really working on this simple question, and the answer seems to be interesting. It seems like we are on the right track. Very quickly, I'll show you what we have done. Well, it turns out these molecular chaperones are also called heat shock proteins, and this is the only technical slide I have, where these guys are actually sensing febrile temperature, which is like the fever temperature. They get activated and do signaling processes and prepare the cell to face heat shock that's happening during fever and during migration to the uh, mammalian host. If you somehow, and we've done that now, if you somehow kill these chaperones, parasite cannot grow. And we've done that not in the lab, not only in the lab, where we can do this in cell culture, but we've created malaria in mice. There is a way to do that, and then given drugs, which we discovered, which can inhibit this heat shock proteins or chaperones. And then the, malaria, uh, the mouse gets cured of malaria. That's the proof of principle. But I will not give you, bore you with details because that's history. It was covered nicely by international press. It came out, it was, I was interviewed by National Geographic about this research. So I think there's all of it on the internet. But in the next last few minutes, and for which I do have a few minutes, I'm going to tell you something more fun that I do. At some point in my research career, I decided, look, enough of malaria. I mean, that's fun, it's going well. But how about having some fun, you know? Work should be fun as well, and you guys should remember that because that's what all the others have told us. Uh, all the others have told us that unless work is fun, you're not going to enjoy it. And so we scientists also have a little bit of fun. And that's what I'm going to tell you, outreach activities to keep our animal industry happy. Well, what we do here, and don't give up on me now. Okay, here. Can we have the video on? You know, my friends, I like animals, I like horses, so my friends often come and tell me that, look, my horse is not, is sick. And this is what a sick horse, one of the sick horses that I came across, a sample was sent to me. Look how much agony this guy is in. And if you love animals, you will feel really bad with this video. This guy has got some serious problem. He's got headache, and this is what horses do when they have severe neurological problem. He's trying to control his pain. It's not able to, he's not able to balance. He's going to collapse. Next day, this animal died. What a beautiful looking animal it died and in a very, very hor horrendous way. We can move to the next slide. The point is, these are the kind of, it, it intrigued me. Why, what happened to this animal? These guys, I mean, you know, I, friends often don't know what you do, but when they found out that I'm a scientist, they said that, can you help us figure out what it is? Because most of us have failed to do that. And all over the country, people were not able to find out what was killing large number of horses in India about a couple of years back. Lots of expensive animals in the tough club died. And that's when they came to me, figure it out what it is. So I went to the turf club on the night of November 2012. I still remember the day because I was called, an animal was sick, having the same symptoms. This is a different animal, but having the same symptoms. I don't have a video for it. This guy was tilting its head on the wall. I have listed, noted the, sort of exactly what I observed. On 14th, I found head tilted on the wall. 15th, I found one, the animal went blind in one eye. On the 16th, it was almost it was dead with neurological f symptoms. Very painful death, in fact. And this was, these were not just random episodes, it was happening all over the country. So all the tough love guys said that, look, can you figure out what it is? Because we can't. Well, I'll cut the long story short because I have only a few minutes more and tell you that we did detailed analysis. I was equipped with the right tools. You know, I had the right technology in my lab, so I said, Stop everything else, let's attack this guy. Let's find out what's happening with this guy. Get the blood sample cranking. You know, I put it through all the technology that I had access to, and this was some really cutting edge technology that I applied. And, and, and what came out was a parasite called trypanosomal parasite. Everybody had missed that, not their fault, because in the blood sample, oftentimes you don't see the parasite. Sometimes it hides in venules, and it sticks to the capillaries. It's, it plays games, you know. It, it, parasites have their own way of fooling scientists and people. But this was not what we observed for this animal that I showed you. We did it by some cutting edge technology. We found signatures of this parasite. Eventually, we, did, we got lots of, our lab became, you know, it got flooded with samples from all over the country because everybody was worried. Imagine, you know, 50 lakhs, 1 million uh, rupee horses and die popping just like that. And so that's what happened. Well, this parasite, let me show you in the next one. Can I have the video, please? These are RBCs, the red cells of horses. And this is one of the early samples that I saw. You see something moving in the center. What's going to emerge out of this is a beautiful 
parasite, beautiful looking, doing ballet, but it does nasty things as I just showed you. This is the guy, this was the culprit which was ca killing those horses. But look how, what a beautiful movement it has. And it, this, is, this is live cell, this is live image, you know, so it's in real time. This is what it looks, you can stop the video. This is just to give you an idea that when you are, sometimes when you are successful, you can see under the microscope these parasites, and for some of these animals we found eventually which were sick and which were dying. Well, problem solved. Many animals died, but at the right intervention, we could give the treatment because we found the problem, and then all the animals were actually, you know, preventive chemotherapy was given. Another problem. I was very surprised. Up until now, I didn't bother to look at animal drugs, you know, medicines. But I realized to my dismay, that the drug that was being used by veterinarians, the last drug was introduced, hey man, even before I was born. You know, I thought I was old, but the medicines that we were using is more than 50 years old. Not only that, it is non-specific because the, nobody knows how it works, and it's inefficacious. That's probably another reason why many animals, animals will still die. We decided that, look, it doesn't help just diagnosing the disease, we also need to find a better way to treat it. We, on to, we are on to finding a new medicine, a better me medicine for the treatment for the problems that I showed you. I won't bore you with these details, but tell you that we can create um, a similar disease in mouse and then use the, using uh, medicines that we discovered, we could actually prevent. For example, you know, the ant mouse which are infected with parasites die on day seven or nine, but the ones which are treated with just go on to survive longer. Those are the first proof of principle studies that one does in labs like mine. Well, that's a good successful step forward. And the next one, two minutes left. Um, we are now doing this in large animals. So in ponies, we are doing experiments because we have to do that to actually make a drug out and to be a commercial success. You have to go to the drug control authority and say that, look, we have tested it in animals and it works. And that's what we are doing in, uh, in large animals. And this, the number of parasites keep coming down as you give the medicine that we have discovered in the lab. So it's been a very satisfying few years for us. And we are hoping that this pipeline through which medicines are discovered, we are really, we've done the discovery, we've done preclinical development, and we are on to clinical development. That's where we are. Just for your knowledge, this is what happens. For every medicine you are taking has gone through these steps. And then we have to go through for approval for marketing. That's where I'm going to end and just say that, look, it's been, a, you know, studying is not all that bad. Like other things that we've heard today, I think a lot of fun things we have heard about today. I'm enjoying science. Science can be fun too. And with those words, I end and thank you all, all of you people for your kind patience. <laughs>